Uh, he grew up locally in Greenwich. Uh, we've showcased some of his movies here over the years, and he's been a big champion supporter of ours here at the Avon. So really, thank you again for joining us here It's tonight. great to be here. Thanks for coming to see it. It means a lot for people that come to the movies. So Neil, uh, this is one of a number of different films that you've worked on. You've really run the gamut now in your career. Uh, science fiction, big budget, uh, very small indies. Could you tell us a little bit about what you as a filmmaker bring to the table when it's a completely different palette from something else that you've worked on in the past? Do you, do you modify your approach in any way when you take on a project like this? Well, I mean, as you said, I'm interested in a lot of different subjects and all the movies are different. And, but one thing that I try to do is to service the particular story you know, uh, visually and narratively, rather than applying some kind of, like, my stamp to some kind of movie, you know, e any kind of movie. So, um, so I really go from the script and from the subject matter and try to figure out what's the best visual way to show this story, to depict this story. And so it really just depends, and I'm interested in a lot of different things, and so I'm interested in figuring out what's the right way, um, you know, to, to be as expressive as possible with the story. And while taking that approach, being that this is a remake of a very successful French language film, The Intouchables, which we showed here at the Avon, what was your relationship to that film and did it contextualize what you did? Uh, did you deviate from it? Can you speak a little bit to what you do when you're making a remake of such a successful movie? Yeah, well, I actually had no interest in making a remake of the movie. In uh -huh. fact, they offered it to me, I think, in 2015, and I turned it down because I thought, uh -huh. I mean, if you know, if, I'm sure many of you have seen the movie, and the movie's great, the original movie. And I thought, why would I? Plus, it was a massive international hit. Um, not so much here, but but worldwide it was. And I thought, what? Why would I do that? You know, why? That just seems like a losing proposition. Um, but then they, the producers, um, nicely came back to me a, a year later and offered it um, to me again. And for some reason, some things had changed. You know, there was sort of a, a divisiveness, as you know, a, sort of a growing divisiveness in the country. And you know, when you think about that, you think like, well, how do we ever get through this? How do we ever kind of bridge this gap and find common ground and all of that? And suddenly, in that in that particular script and in this this story, I what I saw in it was that these two people, just in a very small way, in a very personal way, were and th through small acts of respect and compassion, were actually bridging that gap and we're finding common ground and we're able to see each other as human beings you know who they, even though they were from extremely different situations and you know had huge differences in obviously in race and wealth and in ability and everything else and so um i suddenly thought that that was a movie that i wanted to see and that maybe needed to be made and that i wanted to make and that i actually and also that i knew how to make um, and so then I didn't care about the original movie. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was, you know, I didn't have that same feeling that I'd felt before about it. Like, why would I do this? It's like, you know, I've, I'm sort of always going to be under, in the shadow of this. I didn't care about any of that. And I just thought this was a movie that needed to be made. And, um, so, you know, off we went. Well, I think it suffice to say that you did a great job of translating it into a distinctly culturally American film that, that just, Thank you. it works. Um, and I think a lot of that is attributable to the performances you extracted from both Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston, who couldn't come from more disparate backgrounds themselves as actors go. Kevin Hart It's a being, really weird group of actors. Yeah, I mean, Kevin Hart being Isn't it? one of the world's biggest comedians and Brian Cranston being somebody who you think of in a more, you know, actor's actor classic actor kind of way but their chemistry was great they appeared to get along great on screen and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit other, about actually. do they really no, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, no, what, what fantastic. was that experience like working with the two of them it was great I mean and actually they they have as you see great chemistry and they have great chemistry you know on screen and off screen and for a director that's a you know a massively important thing and makes my job you know immensely easier and so 
you know, you can get, if people don't have chemistry, there certainly have been acting duos in the past where they're successful movies, but they don't have any chemistry in real life, and you can kind of figure out ways as a director to patch that up and to kind of glide over it and, you know, keep them away from each other at the, you know, certain times. But when they do have chemistry, it just makes it, you know, so much easier. It's just much smoother sailing, so. And did they stick to the script, or do we see some ad-libbing? No, the script is very, and it's actually in somewhat different than the original movie. Obviously, there's some similar scenes and things like that, but this, this movie is much, um, uh, sort of has a tighter structure to it. And, um, and I thought that that was important to kind of pay off those, those emotions, to sort of set them up and really um, have them be as powerfully expressed as, as possible. And so, so there was actually no improv in the, in the movie. Wow. Um, and they stuck to it because of that structure and because it was important um, you know, to set up all the little lines. You couldn't kind of lose a piece of them or be talking about something else that wasn't sort of significant to set up, you know, what was, what was to come, you know, sort of this larger journey that they were on. So, so there's actually, there's no, actually there's two lines of improv in the movie, but only two. And um, uh, they're both um, uh, spoken by Brian Cranston. Not Kevin Hart, who you, everybody would expect. That yeah, he, he was going to be the jokey one, but right. he wasn't. He was stuck to everything incredibly closely. Well, that speaks then to the naturalism of the role and performance, because there were instances where I figured out these guys must be just running with. No, it. they were. It was all those lines were all written. That's great. Um, I want to take it out to the audience now and give them as much time as possible. So I don't this think time, this lineup thing well, is going to work, but we'd, okay. We'd love for everybody to come on up here. Don't be bashful. We want to take some questions from you. Nobody's Don't be move. shy. I see people coming. People are going the other way. People are coming. <laughs> people. She's going the wrong way. She thinks the mic's over there. Nobody has any questions this they evening? They do, but they don't want to walk up and All right. the aisle. Anybody? I'm just saying. We're going to cut. Right, come on down. Come on down. If you have there questions and your hands are up, just come on. Start breaker. coming and queuing up. There we go. We've got some people coming. Great. Don't be shy. Um, I was just wondering how you started your directing career in the beginning. Um, I'm a very young, um, and so I was just wondering how you got your inspiration, how'd you get your ideas out there, how'd you really get started? Well, I, I got started, I was always interested in drawing and painting and things like that when I was growing up and in set design for the theater. I did sort of all that stuff as kind of hobbies. And then I, um, I, when I got out of college, I just started working in the business, and then I was always writing on my own, which I think is an important thing to do in the sense that you're controlling your own, you know, the, the things that you want to make, and in a way controlling your own destiny in the sense that you have something that you want to that you want to film or, or make. So anyway, so that's what I, that's what I did. I started off, uh, I sort of made some small music videos and then I started directing commercials and then I was always writing, you, you know, sort of narrative things on my own and then finally one of them um, got made. It took a while. Thank it takes you. a while. <laughs> I mean, you just have to keep doing, you have to just keep making films and or make, you know, shooting video and editing it and writing more and learning from your mistakes. Thank you. Uh, did Kevin Hart actually do the uh, paragliding scene, or was it just a stunt guy? Is that Ryan? <laughs> um, he, um, that's a very good question that I've been trying not to answer. <laughs> because I, I, I actually, I'm somebody that doesn't like talking about, I mean, it's not like I don't like talking about the behind the scenes sort of thing, about how it's done, but I sort of think it like takes away from the sort of the magic of it of, you know, of people think like, oh, well, he's not really doing it. But in, um, and Brian Cranston did it, mm. and, and I did it, and, um, uh, but Kevin Hart did not, do, he would not do it. <laughs> he, um, he was like, why would I, why? I was like, you go in an airplane, it's much more dangerous. He's like, I have to go in an airplane. I have to drive to work. I don't have to go up in a paraglider. <laughs> so he didn't do it. He went up about, 15 feet, but it was all a rig, and it was actually sort of a really interesting, complicated, kind of a fun behind-the-scenes rig um, that we put him in to make it seem as, you know, we were actually on sort of a, uh, not on a mountain, but sort of on a really tall ridge, so it was all just sky behind him. So we sort of shot it 
out in, in the outdoors, but, but he, was not, uh, he was not up there. He was in no danger, <laughs> so, uh, and, which is just the way he wanted it. Um, but, um, but don't tell anybody. Okay. It's the Avon secret. Yes. Hi. How much of the final cast did you have in mind when you took on the role? How, how did say it, the, I'm sorry. Say the, how the did question the was the final work? casting. How much did you uh, get involved in the casting? Was that right? well? well I'm, yeah. As a director, you're completely involved in it. However, those guys were just Brian and 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 Kevin were coming onto the movie just as I was. Um, we all sort of came on at the same time. In other words, the producers were sort of hiring them, somewhat independently of me, and um, and which was unusual for because normally. Sort of to speak to you on all the other movies I've done, and most you know you're involved in you know, you're casting everybody, you're choosing everybody. Um, they were already involved, or you know they were, had already read it and sort of agreed to do it. And then I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to do it with with Kevin, quite frankly, because I didn't want it. I didn't. I knew Kevin Hart's work. I don't know if you guys knew his work mm -hmm. before. And he's you know really funny, but he's sort of a broader comedy. Um, kind of comedy that I didn't think was right for this movie, so I wasn't sure that he was the right guy to be in it. And I, and I f so, but I talked to him um, about it, and he's from a similar background to to this guy, and he, um, you know, he convinced me that he could that he could do it, and um, and you know, he sh really shows that he's got real dramatic chops. So, Thank you. Good yeah, fit. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Neil. David McKenzie. Everybody. A wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, great from beginning to end. And I, I'm glad to see that they are plugging it on TV. I see, I've seen Thank a couple God, of right? trailers already, yeah. which is great. My question is, uh, I thought the casting was perfect. And I wondered uh, how you. many people you thought about or had to to review in order to pick them? Well, usually that happens with the, you know, it, it, sort of it, the farther you go down sort of into the supporting rungs, the more people you're looking at. So, for example, for, for Nicole Kidman's role, you know, we were looking at Nicole Kidman. I mean, we had some other people on our list, but she happened to be interested in it because she had had some things in her life that where she'd actually had had been a caregiver and even though she's you know this is a much more of a supporting role than than she would normally do but i think she something about the the movie and the story um appealed to her and she actually wanted to be a part of it and so you know we weren't going to say no to that though there was a moment where be, kevin if you know, is actually very short. And he actually often plays, you know, they sort of joke that up in a lot of his films and make it part of it. And to me, I was, had no interest in, that, in, interest in that at all. I didn't want to play like that he was, sh you know, maybe yeah, he was a little bit shorter, but I didn't want to make that a thing. And so I deliberately was, everybody that I was casting, they had to be under like five, six, any, any of the supporting roles. And, and for Brian Cranston, he was going to be sitting down the whole time, so it didn't matter. Because I didn't want to make a, uh, you know, any kind of issue of his height. And then Nicole Kidman comes into it and it's like, how can you say no to her? So, and he just ruined my whole plan because she's like six feet tall and he's not. Yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> I really love the film. And um, there was one moment, sometimes it's just a, a, a few seconds of a film, just one little thing sticks in my head and I wonder about how that got into the script or if it came up just sort of spontaneously in the scene with Juliana Margulies when the spot of sauce is on his lapel or his scarf and he says, do I have something on me? And she says, no. And that, for some reason that resonated with me. I was just wondering if there's any, why was that there and how was it, why was it treated in that way? Well, I think, you know, I think the trick for that scene and for her character is what she comes in with her eyes wide open. She knows who he is and she's done her research and that he's, um, you know, some, a person with disability, with a disability. And, um, and I think she comes in with all the best intentions and she's up for it and she's, you know, willing to, to go into this relationship. 
And I think, you know, so then the question is in the scene is like, what triggers her, her change of heart? And I think that, you know, in the beginning of the scene, you know, she's got something in his teeth and she's feeding him and she's doing all of these things for him. And I think the idea with that spot is there's just one, she just can't be, you know, doing it the whole time. Even if it's not going to be a problem, she doesn't need to, you know, wipe up that spot. But then she feels, and she doesn't want to draw his attention to one more thing that he can't, you know, take care of himself. And so it's just this sort of confused and kind of growing sort of uncertainty and, and um, unease for her. And that's kind of the trigger what, when it changes for her, that then she feels guilty that she didn't, that she said no. And so to me, it's that, that's what that was about. Well, that the, made the film sense was at all. very rich with details like that. I really loved it. Thank you. Uh, the, the music was lovely and became more and more emotional and certainly in the ending was the most emotional. Um, and music you don't see. That's the, there's, n there's no visual to that. How did you go about? Well, that music, I mean, the script is by a guy named John Hartmere, who nobody has heard of, and, but he's a really talented um, screenwriter. And that, all of that music, every single piece, or with, within reason, or every single piece of the opera and the um, Aretha Franklin is, in, is written into the script. He had figured it out beforehand, and he had found that, um, he had seen that Aretha Franklin, um, that final song where she sings yep. Ness and Dorma was, as Brian Cranston says in the movie, yep. he, she actually did it at the Grammys, I think yep. in 1999 or something like that, when Pavarotti was sick, and she stood in and, yep. and did it. Um, and he, that wasn't like the first thing he came up with, but when he discovered that, he then sort of, you know, reverse engineered the love of opera on Brian Cranston's side and the love of Aretha that then, you know, that then comes together at the end. So that was really all his doing, but he, you know, he had come up with the Ness and Dorma, you know, from that and then and some of the other pieces It as just well. gave a tremendous hug to the, to the whole movie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So. Thank you for your question. How are we doing? Uh, I'm just wondering from an artistic standpoint, if you can kind of just walk us through the decision that was made to tell, to bring us in from the end of the story at the beginning of the story and sort of let it bleed out from that way? It's a good question because it was a tricky thing. I mean, that's what the, the, the French movie starts that way. And in a way, I, I, you know, I didn't want to do anything that the French movie did and, you know, because I, I didn't want to actually be compared to it constantly. And, and in a way that it, that, that sort of bookend sort of makes sense and it doesn't make sense and we sh it was scripted that way and we shot it that way. We did discuss getting rid of it but we, sh we couldn't figure out anything better and we, and we shot it and we had that same question about why, you know, throughout the editing. It was like, what's this, do what's this doing here? And when we tried it without it, the movie didn't work actually. Somehow we needed to know that those guys had, there needed to be some sense of mystery in their relationship at the beginning. It was like, why is this one guy driving this, this older guy who seems to be non-responsive and why are they running from the police and why does, why does the Kevin character keep looking to him for some sort of reaction and we don't, you know. And it sort of needed that kind of mystery and then it needed seemed to need the, you know, sense that, the, oh, they did have some kind of relationship and that there was some kind of, you know, so that we, so that it, um, I, you know, it, it kind of, it, there was a promise in that opening sequence of what the movie was going to be and what their relationship was going to be. And so without it, 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 was, a, it was a different sort of film. Thank you. I think we have a couple more here. Yeah. Hi. Um, your movies are so different. All the ones you've done so far are sort of you're, you're fearless in sort of the directions you keep going. And I love, if I think I understood correctly, you said earlier that you really love to stay faithful to sort of where you are and what you're doing at that moment. My question is sort of, you know, when I go shopping, I just buy blue like over and over again. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you stay so fearless? How, especially when you're so successful in sort of a genre that you've succeeded in, uh, that you've, uh, how do you then have the 
courage to do something totally different? And how do you stay fresh when you're looking like this film is so different than the others? How do you, what's your secret sort of for treating it exactly the way it should be and, and staying fresh and not relying on your old, your old choices and your old favorites and things? Fear <laughs> is, my, is my trick. It's yeah. fear of failure, yeah. you know? So it, it's kind of true in the sense of like wanting to kind of, you know, not, not rest at all and try to sort of, you know, there's nothing particularly radical about this movie, but it's trying to, you know, but it could have been, you know, if it was just the same as the other movie or was sort of, you know, anyway. So for me, I'm just trying to kind of find interesting ways, interesting stories to tell and that I feel like are meaningful stories um, and that mean something you know, for our times, it sounds kind of pretentious in a way, but it's, but you know, that are meaningful for me as well, and then trying to find an interesting way to shoot them yeah. stylistically, um, so, you know, they don't, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to make a coherent movie, and it's hard to make one that, you know, that pushes the form, and it's, I don't know, I'm just yeah. tr thinking about those things all the time, and, um, and, you know, this hopefully can. having some success with it, and, Sometimes you are not. hugely successful. And oh, thanks. Thank you. We look forward to your next film, too. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Hi. Hi. I love this movie. And thank all you. throughout, all I heard was everybody's l laughing out loud. And I kept thinking how much improv was going on between Kevin and Brian, or was it really all scripted that way? Yeah, there's zero improv, actually. All really? Sc all scripted. Yeah, they really stuck to it. They were very fun and funny to be with on the set. And, you know, you can see Brian's a real, Brian is as funny as Kevin is in a different, different way. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it was all, it was all structured but and whoever, scripted. But whoever was the author, I want to, who's Yeah, the yeah, the, the guy John Hartmere wrote all those lines. And really, it, re it reads, you know, Kevin's lines read in his voice and, you know, it sounds but like, they you know, were, they were you written the for their voices. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, they, they were, and successfully and natural, so, I think. So the, and the laughing, right? I, I, I thought you were going to keep track of how much laughter was going on. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. I think we have one final question, unless we have any last stragglers. Last chance. Hi again. Um, how true was the script to the real life story in terms of Del getting fired, Del reuniting with his family, and a lot of the other things that happened? It's loosely, it, you, if you know the, the, the movie is, this movie is based on the French movie, which is based on the lives of two real people who are still alive and still very good friends. And, um, and so it's, it's true. Obviously, we've transposed it to New York, and so that's, you know, we're getting a little far afield from their experience in, in, in Paris. But, um, but the dynamic of their relationship is, is accurate. And um, they, you know, they kind of had this love-hate relationship. In, fa in fact, the, um, the real Philip called, called Dell his, his um, he called him his guardian devil. <laughs> so, and they, I mean, it was actually much crazier things happened. Like he, I think the, the Abdel Salou, who's the real Dell, he, you know, he would, dr he'd get in the car, he was driving so fast, he crashed the car as the driver with Philip in, in the car, and I think maybe his family in the car too, or something, because <laughs> Philip actually, when, the real story is when Dell re first joined him, Philip's w wife was still alive, and then she did eventually die of cancer, but, um, but, uh, yeah, so he had car accidents, and he, I think he, he stole things from him, and he was pretty crazy. But they, be, they really, but f the real Philip really, really loved the guy, and, um, hmm. and they were really great. They're still great friends, actually. Thank you. We've got one last question. Uh, so from like a plot structure perspective, a lot of this movie uh, seems to build towards stasis between the two characters, where in a lot of movies, you build noticeably towards conflict. So my question was, um, I noticed that especially in the scene where he first calls Lisa the pen pal, there's sort of like a camera movement that lingers on Brian's reaction, where it's contemplative and we don't think much of it, but it seems like it plants the conflict, which is a really sudden tonal shift. So besides that, like how did you direct that and how did you plant that in the movie? Well, I think, um, you know, the the, 
movies are, drama is conflict. And um, so you're always looking for, which is not necessarily, you know, what, what the rest of us want in our lives, but, but it makes for good, good storytelling. And so you're always looking for those collisions between people and those people being at odds, even in the smallest ways. And then, you know, and, and obviously visually there's ways to emphasize that or to diffuse it, it depends on what, what the scene is. So, um, you know, in, in, I mean, though, in, in a way, the, you know, as you said, the movie's all looking for common ground, and they weren't, you know, they were at odds, but they weren't, like, screaming at each other, but they were just sort of from, you know, they were looking at each other from across the divide and not really seeing each other as, as total human beings, actually. And so, you know, again, it's, you know, in, 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 in different degrees, but so there's, you know, there's ways to show that, and, and um, you know, and some different director would have done it a different way, but, but there's, you know, that could have equally been as, as valid and effective, so. Thank you. Oh, we're gonna, we got, do we have time for one more, Neil? One, we've got one person right here in the front. The applause we'll take, for so. his question. Yeah. I'll repeat the question so the audience can hear it. What was your favorite scene in the movie? That's a really hard, hard question. Um, Pull them all out here at the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do like that scene at the end where Kevin gives the house to his, you know, the mother of his son and his son. And um, I, I, I always enjoy watching that. And when she mouths thank you to him, I, I still f feel like it's very moving. So. On that note, folks, let's give Neil one more big round of thank applause. You. Thanks for coming. Neil, thank you again so much for coming back and joining us at the Avon. Thank you. I, I just have to say the movie comes out on January 11th, so yeah, pl FYI. Folks, please tell everybody this movie will be going out wide across the country, and this was, as we mentioned, the first screening in Connecticut, That's so right. please do spread the word. Have a great night. Thank you for coming.